Alright, so another major part of the hero's journey and these stories in general is this idea of self-discovery. Of what, the, what happens to the hero over the course of the story. Right? The hero generally doesn't stay exactly the same over the course of the entire story. And usually there are two parts to that. There is doing something that helps society, and that that thing that you do that helps society is something that you enjoy doing and that you find some satisfaction in. Right? So Superman does what he does because he has the ability to do so, and because he thinks it's important, so forth and so on, and it helps society. What's interesting is the emphasis on those two. In the West, typically, you find this thing that you love to do, and that turns out to help society. In Asia, it's swapped. Think Iron Man. Tony Stark is a brilliant, brilliant entrepreneur, playboy, philanthropist, right, weapons dealer. He has all of these skills. And then a traumatic event occurs to him, and he decides, I'm going to use these to help society. Right? His skills come first. Think Gundam. Amuro doesn't want a pilot. He's not trained as a pilot. This is not in his skill set. He actually does have some engineering ability. But this is totally outside of his realm of, of experience, and he is forced to do it anyway. Much of the show is about him not wanting to do it, and then coming to realize that he is going to do it anyway, and he's, he has developed the skills to do it well. It's a very strong reversal. It's this very social, socially oriented thing. Yes, sir, in the back. Um, I, something popped up with regard to the Iron Man with uh, sure. certain um, Western shows that have been adapted in Japanese culture, like mm -hmm. Iron Man, for example. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, a Japanese version of Iron Man. And, uh, that's what that's from? Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Yeah. So, like, uh, I, what, what have you noticed as far as the differences for those ghosts? Like, uh, and yeah. I have noticed, I haven't seen a lot of the Japanese version, but I did see the, mm. that there was like this, a lot of this focus in shifting relationships. Like, uh, yeah. is, is that something that is like also observed when you do have those crossovers where a show exists in both cultures, but produced kind of out of their own country? So who here has seen um, Avengers Disc Wars or Marvel Disc Wars? Nobody, wow, okay. So this is an anime series of, um, uh, with licensed Marvel characters where the, the various Avengers are shrunk down into sort of two inch hologram things, which they, they're then called out into battle with kids, so kids can actually use them as Pokemon. It's hilarious. Um, so, Iron Man, I choose you, basically. Um, and they're all paired with various uh, uh, kids. And um, the, the, they only have like enough power to fight for like three minutes or something. So you have to be careful about Hulk versus this guy. Um, and here's the interesting thing. Tony Stark appears to have no problem being shut away in the Pokeball for, you know, 23 and a half hours a day um, because, gosh, we've got to solve this problem, all of us together, right? All of the Avengers are okay with this because there's their bigger issues to take care of. Like, heck no! You think Tony Stark is going to be fine with that? He'd be off with it now. So, yes, absolutely, when, when it's adapted for anime, that does shift around a lot. Now, in the case of Iron Man Rise of the Technovore, there was less of that because Iron Man had just fairly recently come out in Japan, and they were kind of riding high on Tony Stark's individualism. Right. So that was very much a, uh, an aspect of the show that they wanted to continue on with. Um, that said, there is a lot less about him being, it's further in his career, it's not about him finding himself, he already knows, I am Iron Man, I am doing these things, and he is much more an integrated part of helping people. Um, so yes, absolutely, they, 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 they'll readapt it to, to hit those things. Good questions. <laughs> right, right, and they also did other Marvel shows as well. Yeah, usually, the game will portray these characters being somewhat less heroic mm -hmm. than we do. Yeah, exactly. There's just less of a focus on that. Um, and so again, Gundam, you know, you, you have this character who is very much forced to work for other people and then finds a reason for it. Um, speaking of Gundam, let's talk about war a little bit. Because war is, comes up a lot in Gundam. <laughs> Imagine that. And there are some interesting trends in that in anime because, of course, Japan has had very different experiences with war than America has. One of the things you see a lot over here in America is this kind of absurdly over-the-top um, warmongering military guy, right? Big guns, you know, we got we, we to gotta nuke them first. We ask questions later. Here's the thing about this. You know, we all live sort of near D.C. and Washington. I don't know about you. I, I grew up, I had, you know, military brats around me. 
I knew a fair number of military people. I didn't know any of them who were anything like this. <laughs> right? It's, it's this odd stereotype we have, and I think actually the movie Doctor Strange is part of the reason for the stereotype. But more importantly, um, it establishes the idea that military people just kind of love to fight in wars. When right? they'll tell me, I'm the one getting killed. I don't want to fight in wars. But anyway, over in Japan, when you have these military enemies, they tend to have much more specific reasons for what they do. The show will establish where they're coming from and their specific objectives. It's not a purely rah-rah, you know, everyone else is an enemy. It's no. They are a problem that need to be taken care of in this specific way and I'm going to do that. Moreover, there's more of a, a focus on what war does to people in Japan. So there's this theme you see often in Gundam that um, war drives people mad in Gundam all the time. They are literally crazy from what went, um, uh, what they went through and that they're willing to do stranger things than the ordinary person would. There's a very strong theme about that. You'll also notice this refrain that uh, defense is the only acceptable way or reason to get into a fight. Uh, yes, sir. Do you think that like, the Japanese approach to war and media, do you think it has to do with their defeat in World War II and all the awesome that happened? It's, it's, it's certainly... Uh, so. I will preface any discussion about this with a statement that I'm not Japanese, so I'm not qualified to psychologically, you know, say, but I think so. Um, I, I think certainly the fact that Japan, and also remember, Japan invaded Korea, China, and Russia in the early, uh, early 20th century and won all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Say what? And most parts of Southeast Asia. Absolutely, yes. Huge swaths of it. They had a huge empire before World War II. And then they were completely crushed in World War II. So it wasn't simply losing a war, it was losing a war after many victories. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I think that, that was a big thing. The other thing about that, and relevant to this topic, um, they built up this very strongly militaristic and imperialistic culture up to World War II. You will find, when people describe what it was like in Japan before World War II, how often they use the word, it was crazy. We were, we, you know, people were just really mad back then. And that's the thing. Is, and partly, obviously, it's like any culture trying to grapple with this very specific you know, um, thing that happened to them. But it's the same rhetoric you see in Gundam. Right? War drives people crazy. And so that is part of how they, um, I, I do think, they are, they are in a sense working through that, the, the effects of that defeat. The other problem about it too, of course, is that I was just watching Grave of the Fireflies last week, and you forget how a single sweep of firebombs will just level a city. There's nothing left. So Japan had such a dramatic destruction as a result of the end of World War II. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh boy. Uh, that, that gets into interesting territory. Um, so, so you see this, this thing that defense is the only acceptable way. And I think this also is, is part of that as well. Um, although part of that is also, for lack of a better term, a political pop culture play. Because if you're doing a, an action series for kids in the 1960s where people are fighting with giant robots, how do you sell that in a culture that explicitly outlawed war forever in 1946? Right? You do it by saying, well, somebody else attacked first. So they're just defending themselves. Which, granted, is a standard martial arts concept. But this was also you know, a way for TV shows to not offend parents and other people about the content of these shows. Now, other side of that coin, absolutely this is a fundamental belief of Japanese society. You see this all over the place in all sorts of... <coughs> You know, media for adults, for kids, for teenagers, novels, you name it. This comes up over and over again. It's not just a, a, a defense for, for you know, cartoons, if you will. Um, it is certainly there. I love this slide, partly because I, I get to watch people react to this slide. And the people who haven't watched much Gundam look at this and go, ooh, he's doomed. And people who have watched Gundam go, even odds. <laughs> you know, it would be okay. You know, Tenzaku's one of them. Anyway. Um, so let's also talk about shoujo for a little bit. And shoujo heroines. 
it's remarkable how much agency shoujo heroines have, i.e. how much they actually do stuff. They go in there and they charge in and they fight and they are the ones taking charge of the entire story. Why is that? Especially when you contrast it to our fiction about girls. Isn't it romantic? Yeah. Note, Taming a Wild Scott is a claimed by the Highlander novel. Ew! You know? Eek. So, a lot of our even romantic fiction aimed at girls tend to be about a woman for whom a guy shows up and so the, the, the girl suddenly has to react to the guy. And the story is about her trying to deal with the fact that, oh my gosh, the guy, what do I do? Right? Yes. That Tammy Wild Scott thing, mm -hmm. it's sad. That makes me ashamed of my Celtic heritage. <laughs> <laughs> that had to show oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, So I, I pulled both of these from a, a Tumblr called uh, WTF Bad Romance Covers. Yeah. It's fantastic. Every Thursday they do two covers featuring uh, um, Scotsman on the covers. Because there's so many, because many kilts apparently sell romance stories. It's bizarre. Um, so we tend to have these stories where girls are reacting to other male characters as opposed to girls having their own agency. Um, <clears throat> now, now, here's the thing about Twilight. Okay. And I, I should say, Every so often I do this, and I will have a few girls in the audience who give me murder stares <laughs> about Twilight. I am not here to bash Twilight, to be clear. I am here to say it's unfortunate that in Twilight, Bella has her life, and then guys show up, and much of the story is about her reacting to what the guys do. She has very little agency in her own story, and the one major time when she goes against what her boyfriend wants, and what everyone else wants, is to do something that makes her more like her boyfriend, right? And again, I, I'm not saying that Stephanie Meyer intended that. I'm saying that probably unconsciously that just kind of is how the story ended up. Over here, we just, and even in pop culture, we consistently have this idea that even if with girls who are the freaking stars of their own stories, it tends to be more about the guys than the girls. And it's just it kind of helps them, unlike a lot of other mm. Asian countries, Japan isn't really all that confusion. True, yes. Um, which is a good point. Um, so, Japan over time has adopted several different sort of religious traditions. Confucianism way in the past, and then they modify that with Buddhism and other things. Confucianism, Confucianism has very much gone away, especially when they opened up to the West. They kind of realized, yeah, that's not going to fit with modern society. But, um, but in, you know, shoujo series, Girls have the power, they're going off fighting people. It's pretty awesome. Why? Sally the Witch. I think it's one of the major reasons. This came out in 1966. It was the first JoJo anime series. It was about a girl named Sally who lives in a magical land. It's supposed to say magical kingdom, not quite the same thing. Um, and her parents are magical, everything else is magical, everything's awesome, and she's bored. She's bored of all of her magical schoolwork. So she's, she decides she's going to go down to um, the, the regular earthen realm and make friends. And so she teleports herself down to the real world. She magics up a house and furniture and a tea set so that um, she can invite these, these girls over to have um, time with, uh, with them. They realize that one of the girls left the package in a store. They go back to the store to discover it's being robbed. Sally proceeds to use her magic to confuse the burglars and tie up the burglars and leave them for the cops, who took like hours to show up. Saves all of her friends and goes off. And that's episode one of Sally the Witch. In other words, Sally has total control over everything she does. She is the one with complete agency over her entire life. She is more powerful than the cops, <laughs> which is pretty awesome. And so that set the template. You can have these, these shows for girls where the girls are the, are the heroes and they're not being um, otherwise, you know, the story doesn't have to, to, to revolve around boys at all if you don't want to. Now, <clears throat> You also see in this, the idea of the shoujo help me, the, the male love interest of the girl. Oh, we suck at this in the West. I'm just going to say that straight up. Um, because in anime, like with Tuxedo Mask, you can have a, a helpmate who knows more than the protagonist, who can do things better than the protagonist, who saves the protagonist's butt, and 
Sailor Moon always initiates the battle, and she always lands the final blow. Right? He never gets in her way in that way. He's there to give her a hand, which is awesome. Um, for a lot of reasons, Japanese staff have figured out that it is fine to have lots of other characters in the stories as long as we, we, we remember who the hero is, right? Is the girl, not the god. Um, and, uh, and again, and to be fair, when you have boy shows, the boy is the hero. That's, that's the way it's, that's cool. Now, there's a tendency in the West to really overemphasize the awesomeness of shoujo and not talk about any of the negative aspects. So there are other side effects of shoujo.